So happy new year. Happy new year. Yeah. Last I saw you guys, it was Christmas Eve. How many of you were there for that? Okay, oh yeah, a couple of you. That was awesome. A big thank you to the team that made that possible. We had a, uh, just a, an awesome team that was working uh, just really hard uh, to create that context. And so, so we're just super thankful to that team. Can we give that team a round of applause that made Christmas Eve? So what if you could only do one thing in 2020? I mean, what if there was only like just one thing that you could do in 2020? Now, so, so this is the time of year where making resolutions and um, making sort of commitments and, hey, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, it's, it's kind of popular, right? And, and oftentimes, we might make a few. And I don't know if that's to secure the fact that we're probably not going to do the first one. So if we aim for four, we'll hit maybe half of them and, and we'll, we'll feel okay about ourselves or whatever the case might be. But but we are, we're a multitasking, we've got a couple of things usually going at the same time type people. And so when it comes to resolutions, um, oftentimes we can, we can pick maybe, maybe more than one or, or, or two. We can, we can kind of diversify our resolutions. And so I'm just curious, uh, how many of you have a New Year's resolution? Anybody? It's not like, there's no shame in that. So cool. <laughs> it's cool. Like New Year, let's try to get after that. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, cool. So I wanted to shift the question um, from what if you could only do one thing in 2020 to what if you should only do one thing in 2020? I'm going to read from uh, the onething.com website, and, uh, and this, this will maybe set the context for where we're going today. Humans are capable of doing two things at once, but our brains aren't able to focus on more than one thing at a time. The prefrontal cortex controls focus, which is a finite resource. When we do two things at once, we are dividing and watering down our focus. That's why researchers now say multitasking fails on various levels. Not just for some, but for the vast majority of people. Studies from psychologist David Strayer found that 97.5% of people failed multitasking tests and concluded that there is now no way to increase your ability to multitask. In fact, additional research out of Stanford University found that chronic multitaskers actually performed worse than occasional multitaskers. If you don't believe me, there's a, a statistic from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration that found that texting while driving, which is multitasking, is actually six times more dangerous than driving drunk. Research has found that multitasking causes us to lose 28% of our workday. So, what if you should only do one thing in 2020? What if the research points to the fact that if you really want to do anything well, you've got to pick one thing and do that well. And as a matter of fact, if you don't, it might even be a danger to those around you. I would love to introduce you guys to a few friends of mine, if you're cool with that, okay? Okay? So I'm going I'm to introduce you guys uh, to a few friends of mine today, and I'm, I'm pretty super pumped about this message. I love, I love preaching, but there's some messages where you're like, oh man, I can't wait to share. And, and this, is, this happens to be um, one of them. So forgive me if sometimes I yell throughout the whole message. I'm going to try not to do that, but I'm, I'm pumped, okay? So I want, I want you guys um, to meet a few of my friends, okay? And, uh, and you're going you're gonna to meet them by hearing what they have to say, and then we're going to talk a little bit about their lives after. Um, so if you have your outlines, this is going to be a great way for you to follow along. The scriptures are going to be up here um, on, the, on the screen, uh, but these are going to be great scriptures for you guys to dive into um, uh, throughout the week and later this day. And, and, you know, it's maybe just a great way to start off your fast by reading each of these chapters um, uh, throughout, uh, throughout this week. And so I'm going to... I'm going to introduce you to a few of my friends. 
One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing. One thing. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. One thing. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better portion, and it will not be taken from her. One thing, one thing, one thing. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. One thing. One thing. And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers and gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us peace on every side. One thing. One thing. Can you say that with me? One, two, three. All right, let's try that again, because some of you were like one, and I started counting. It was weird, right? All right, I'm going to count, and we're going to say it all together. One, two, three. One thing. One thing. One thing. One thing. Seeking the presence of God. One thing. If there's only one thing that you can do, if there's only one thing that you should do in 2020, it is seek the presence of God, Period. Seek, get after, do whatever you have to do to find, immerse yourself, saturate, wait for, hope in, look to the presence of God, the person of God. Getting after God is our one thing, Avenue Church, in 2020. We're in good company. I told you that you were going to meet some of my friends, right? All right, so, so maybe you, you recognize some of them from, from the things that they wrote and the things that they said. Um, we're going we're to take a little bit of a walk now through who they were and, and what was, what was kind of going on in their life and, and why maybe that, that one thing mentality was so important uh, to them. One thing. Thing. So I want you to meet David. First of all, I want you to meet David. You guys say, hi, David. Hi. He's not here. And you're like, I'm not doing that stupid. That's okay. If you don't want to play along, that's okay. But I love when you talk back, okay? So I'm, we're going to do this every time. You're going to meet different people, okay? And you just, if you'll entertain me with a hi, Mary, or, you know, that would be cool. And so, so David is the, is the first one that we're going to meet. And he's, he's definitely probably my, my best Old Testament friend. Now, I think it's important that you guys should make friends with the people in the Bible. I do. I heard somebody who was teaching me about, like, this is my friend here, and this is what I learned from his life. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's a cool way to, like, look at Scripture. And, and, and so as you read Scripture, I think that you should— there are people and characters and narratives that you're going to connect with more than others, and I think they should become your friends, and you should learn from them, and, and, and you, should, you should, like, look back on their lives often. David is, like, my BFF— from the Old Testament. I love this guy. I love this guy. A couple of things about David, right? We're going to meet David. Um, you might know him, or if you don't, he was a shepherd. So, so David, is a, he's a shepherd boy. That's how he came up. And he was, known to, um, he was known to take out animals that came after the sheep. 
Okay, so it d- doesn't say that he was like super big and super buff. It says, I think at some point, that he was ruddy and handsome. I don't, I don't know why that was important, but the scriptures include that somewhere. And so, so but it, he's not like this big, huge guy who's got like, you know, gnarly hands that can rip apart. He's just this, this shepherd boy, and, and he's known to kill animals that come at the, the sheep he's supposed to be protecting. So we know he's a shepherd. That's cool. That's cool. What else do we know about, about David? Well, we know that he's a warrior. Um, so if you know anything maybe about the Bible or, or you've, you've kind of heard stories from the Bible, you might be familiar with David and Goliath. All right, we're doing this. We're not going to meet Goliath today, okay? So you don't need to worry. Don't be, don't be afraid. He's not my best friend, but David is. And, and you probably know the, the narrative of, of David and he fights Goliath and he, he's got his stones and he those. I mean, he kills the giant. And so we know that he's not only a shepherd, but he's also a warrior. So this is a guy who knows what it, what it is to go to battle. He knows what it is to face enemies. He's, he's a shepherd. He's a warrior. He's also a king. He's probably the most famous king of Israel. And under David's reign, man, it was awesome. There was like a united kingdom in, in Israel. They experienced some really cool stuff. And so David, um, if you know him from the surface— you might know one of those, those things about him. And those are all pretty good. As a matter of fact, my, my four-year-old, um, he, he's pretty fond of any story where you get to throw rocks and somebody gets knocked down, okay? And so if he gets to pick, we, we, um, it's, I forget what the app is called, but it's got a little picture of Jesus on it. And, and it's, it's like a Bible story app and, and they get to pick them at night. And, and this is, um, he, you know, we, we, there's a picture of like a slingshot on this one that he can pick. And, and so, you know, little, uh, little Cade, he likes some, some, of that, some of that stuff that's going on in there. And so if you know David, you might think, man, this is a guy who was courageous. He was brave. He took down enemies. And you might think this is about, you should be courageous and brave like David. But actually, what I want to highlight to you is that David was a man who was intimately familiar with fear fear. And I believe that we are a people who are intimately familiar with fear because I am one of you. And fear has has walked the long journey with me. And anytime I preach about anxiety or fear or things like that, I get like a a pretty um, warm response because it's as if you're walking through some of the same things that I'm walking through You're thankful that it's not all put together in me and that we can both all look together to Jesus to give us what we can't find in ourselves when we walk through that darkness. And so so David's your guy. If you're somebody who walks through fear, if anxiety is something that has been a very real and hurtful and life-altering thing for you or even for someone you love, then what David does should be very important to you right now. You should be leaning in and locked in to what I'm about to tell you because these are not my words. These are David's words who in Psalm 27, which you must, if you are somebody who battles the monster of fear, you must read this psalm and ask God's spirit to burn it in your heart and bring it fresh to your mind every day. Psalm 27, Psalm 27, Psalm 27. I just want to preach that over anyone here who struggles with fear as I preach it over myself. Because in this psalm, in this psalm, we'll see that David talks about Enemies that are rising up. An army that encamps against you. You ever felt like there's an army encamped against you? And sometimes that army is is full of like things that you brought in and has your voice in it. And sometimes it's an army that's unseen. And sometimes it's an army that is seen. Listen, David's your guy. And and this is where David goes. Ready? This is, this is where David goes when, when he's walking through these battles that sometimes have, have a name like Goliath or sometimes maybe have a name like a, a, an opposing army or, or maybe they just, maybe this, that, that quiet, continual, subtle whisper that you might experience. One thing, one thing I have asked of the Lord. He could have asked anything. 
Do away with my enemies. Give me more strength. Make me a person of courage. Take the fear away. David doesn't ask for that. One thing I have asked of the Lord. What is it, David? What's your one thing, man? I'm all ears. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What David asked for and desired more than anything was the presence of God. I'm asking for one thing, just that I could be near you, that I might be in proximity with you. You've got to make yourself known to me, God, in this moment. God, where are you? He's, this is not an escapist prayer. David's not running from his Goliath. He's standing. He's battling. He's moving forward. He's facing his fear, but not without his one thing, which is the presence of God. Later in the psalm, he and God seem to have this dialogue where it's, where it's like, you know, uh, well, let me just read it rather than from my memory. It says this, um, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, verse 7, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, O you who have been my help. Cast me not off, forsake me not, O God of my salvation. David has this like journey. Even in, even in the psalm, it seems like. And his confidence and his hope and his courage all come from one thing. The presence of God. It was like David knew he had to do whatever he needed to do to get with, be with, have intimacy with his God. That if he could just seek after his God, then everything else would be okay. I'd like to meet Paul. Paul. Now, Paul, you might, you might know Paul. Um, Apostle Paul. Church planter Paul. Author Paul. A couple of things that you may or may not know about Paul. He's a persecutor of the church before he got saved. So he was, he, he was like hating on the church. There was, the, the church was breaking out. It was being birthed and, and the Holy Spirit had come and people were preaching the gospel message. Y'all know what the gospel message is? The gospel message is just come, come dirty. Come as you are. Don't go get cleaned up and then come and get all religious for me. No, no, no. Just bring your nasty self as you are. I already know you, I already see you, I already want you, I already paid for you. Just come and just come as you are, because here's the gospel promise. That God sent his son to die for your sin and to die for my sin. To take the penalty that that, that would actually make you go have to try to clean yourself up. Jesus, Jesus got dirty for you and got crushed for you so that you could come as you are. Your sin placed upon him, my sin placed upon him, and him crushed in our place. And on the third day, he overcomes our sin. He overcomes death. He comes back. The grave, the, t the tomb, it's, it's borrowed. It's a historical evidence that the price has been paid in full and that you can come just as you are and say, God, I'm not cleaning myself up because I believe that what you've done for me in Christ is enough. I'm turning from this life. I'm no longer going to live here, but I'm not cleaning myself up. I'm just coming as I am and I'm resting. I'm turning from one life. I'm turning from one belief system where, where I, I'm sort of the savior and I'm looking for life outside of you and I'm just saying, Jesus, you're enough. Amen. Jesus, I receive you. Jesus, I trust you. I believe in you. I believe that what you did is enough for me. Will you forgive me? Will you receive me as I am? And the answer is an affirmative yes. 
that message was shaping the world. The Holy Spirit had already empowered it, and people were coming as they were. And they were receiving love and acceptance and forgiveness and newness and going out as different people. And Paul didn't like that. And Paul, Paul was persecuting that, and he felt it was his, was his like religious obligation to do so. Paul, man, he was actually doing the best with, with what he had. His, his knowledge told him, I've got to get against this. I've got to stop this. So Paul was on one side of sort of the gospel spectrum until God invited Paul to come as he was. And he received that gospel grace because of what Christ had done for him. So you might know Paul as a persecutor of the church, or you might know him on the other side of his conversion where he was an apostle, where he was sent into the world to then spread this radical message of grace that had changed his heart. You might know him as a church planner. You might know him as an author. But one of the things I love about Paul, like David, is, is there was a side to him that might not be as famously known. I mean, you might know it if you've... If you've studied his life. If he's a friend of yours, you're probably uh, familiar with this as it pertains to Paul. But the word I thought about as I, as I looked at Paul, my friend's life, was um, Paul was, he was undone. Paul was undone. He was not a finished product. If you read some of his letter to the church in Rome, especially in chapter 7, You'll see that he's, he, I do, why do I do the things I hate and why don't I do the things I want to? And, and you'll see that Paul refers to himself as the chief of what? Sinners. Paul was undone. He was still a work in progress. And so the cool thing about Paul, and, and this, is, this is one of the things I love about Paul as my friend, is that it allows me to be undone. It allows me to not be perfect and finished and, and, and polished on the outside. It allows me to still be in progress. It allows me to still be messy and broken and needful of Jesus even after I've come dirty. Do you understand that? That's important that you understand that it's not like you come one way and then now all of a sudden you've got you've to be something different. God makes you a new creation, but it takes time for that to take effect in our slow minds and hearts. Are you, do you understand that? And, and so it's important that you understand what, what Paul would do with that. You can do a couple things. You can pretend it's not as messy as it is. You could just know it and not tell anybody. You could minimize your sin. You could do a lot of stuff. Or, look at, look at what Paul does here. He says this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, this, like, this resurrection life. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. It's like Paul saying, listen, I, there's been some really cool success in my, in my, in my new life. I've, I'm not doing this anymore, and like there's, I'm planting churches, and then that, that's really cool. And there's still things that are being worked out. There's still things that I still do, and man, I just, I hate them, and I wish I didn't do them. Here's what Paul's saying. I'm not looking back, either on the good or the bad. I mean, the good might encourage you as to God's faithfulness, and so that's cool. We know that Paul probably would, would say, thank you, Lord, you're faithful. But I'm not getting caught in historical moments. I'm pressing forward because for the call of the upward prize. Like for Paul, earlier in the passage, he says, for me to live is, it's, it's like Christ, and everything else is, Christ is my life, and everything else is rubbish. It's all about the person of Jesus for Paul. He, he's a one thing type guy and, and his one thing is that he presses on but his, his motivation comes back to the person of God. His life is meaningless, meaningless without Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Amen. One thing. One thing. Not his performance but the person of God. I'd like for you to meet Mary. Can you guys say hi Mary? 
Yeah. Hi, Mary. That's awesome. We didn't do that with Paul. Whatever. I got to keep going, but. Now, Mary's, I think, I think she might, you know, okay, so like Jesus wins. He's the, he's my favorite favorite. Okay, but, but if I've got like a, if I've, I don't know, if I got like a New Testament best friend, that's love, Mary. I love me some Mary. Now, um, this is, this is Mary, who's sister of Martha, and um, they're friends of Jesus, and this is Mary, whose brother was Lazarus. You know, he dies, and then Jesus ha- waits a minute, and then brings him back to life, and um, so, so Mary, you know, you, you, a couple of things you might, you might know about Mary. Uh, she's, she's a woman, okay? I mean, I know it's a big, deep theological truth I just laid on you there. Wow, this dude's such an insightful teacher. I'm so glad I'm Kate in the Avenue. No, um, but it's kind, it's kind of important because in the first century Jewish setting, being a woman wasn't what it is today. It carried with it different things. Um, and and there, was, there was a real sense where, like, um, rights and significance and um, value was, was not what it, what it is today. And so being a woman then was a different context. Mar- that, that's, that's Mary's context. Uh, she was a friend. She was a friend of Jesus. So, so Jesus ministered to many people, and he, and he, you know, he hung out with a ton of people, but, but he, had, he had some friends, and, and Mary happened to be one of his friends, and she was a worshiper. She was one who worshiped Jesus. And um, I find it interesting in, in Luke 10, the passage that we read from, uh, Jesus is coming over, and they are getting ready. And, and so um, when Jesus is coming over to your house, you probably would be consumed with many things. Um, what, what, in my house, we have white tile and four kids. That's horrible. That's just a horrible combination, okay? I don't know what color the grout was supposed to be or was at some point, but it's probably not it anymore. So it's like, do you clean it? Because then you'd have to clean all the grout or what? Like, you just leave it that, like, pale, whatever. Um, you know, it's, it's like, there's, there's probably a ton of stuff that would be racing around in your mind if Jesus were coming over. Many things. And so when Jesus then gets there, depending on your personality, many things would probably continue to run around in your mind. Food, environment, atmosphere. Are we going to have some music in the background? I mean, certainly it would be easy, and you would even think hospitable, to be thinking about many good things when Jesus was in your presence even for him. Some of the things that I was thinking about when it pertained to Mary was um, certainly the fact that she's, un- she's, she's misunderstood. In this particular passage, she's misunderstood by her sister and maybe by some other people who aren't mentioned, but, but her actions are misunderstood. And so if you can relate to being misunderstood, not fully received by family and friends, thought of as weird, awkward, like why, are, why, why is life look like this now that you say you have Jesus? Your workplace, your, your Christmas morning, whatever it might be. If you're a person who walks through being misunderstood, maybe even in your most intimate relationships of marriage or, or parenting, or, or maybe the word that I thought of just contextually was insignificant. I mean, I, I don't know if Mary battled feelings of insignificance, but in her context as a woman, in the midst of, of all that was happening, you know, this is, this is me just thinking through this. I, there's no text that affirms it. And so this is me looking at the context. But, but, but possibly she, she worked through feelings and, and, and difficulties of insignificance. And so if you find yourself in 2020 and you're dealing with some purposelessness, 
insignificant. It's like it's the same thing over and over again. You see other people advancing. You're not where you thought you wanted to be. It's like life is passing you by and you're thinking about uh, uh, decisions that you could have made or should have made or you're, you're misunderstood. You're, you're kind of like getting inward and you're, you're thinking like, man, what, what's it all about? Check out what Mary does. But the Lord answered her, talking to Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the better portion, and it will not be taken from her. Why? Because Mary had positioned herself at the feet of Jesus. So she was, she was hanging out with Jesus in the house like this while the, while the party's happening. And Martha, her sister, I mean, she's consumed with a lot of good things. But Mary's like, no, no, no. Jesus is here. I got one thing on my mind. And what's interesting, if you look at the passage and you, and you just, you put one and one together, you're going to see that if she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, for her to get after her one thing, proximity was really important. And what I mean by that is that everything else had to be going on where? Behind her. Because if she sat in the back of the room and checked out Jesus from afar, it would have been really easy to be distracted with the comings and the goings of everything that was happening. But Mary was like, no, 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 no. Everything else can wait. Jesus, what do you got? Jesus, here I am. Let's do that. You're my one thing. I know, I know, I know there's a lot of stuff that I need to be responsible. I, I understand that there's a lot of good things I could be doing right now. Jesus, my proximity is here. You're my one thing. Go. And Jesus is like, it's not going to be taken from her. She might be misunderstood. She might be called irresponsible. She might be called a ton of things. She might, she might miss out on some other stuff. But, but the Old and the New Testament make clear that those who seek the Lord will not be put to shame. You got to find out where your proximity is or you'll be distracted. I can almost guarantee it. One thing. You guys want to meet Asa? Everybody say, hi, Asa. We actually have an Asa that was with our youth group. I think he's with the youth group now in the back. Um, back to hi, Asa's parents. I think I saw you guys. Hey, what's up? Great name, by the way. Great name, by the way. Asa. King Asa from the Old Testament. What do we know about Asa? Well, he was a king. He was a warrior. And in 2 Chronicles, we can see the story where he was also a reformer. He was somebody who wanted to um, bring the, the nation of, um, uh, I want to say Judah. Ugh, you can correct me if it was Israel, but I believe the nations had already split, and he was the king of Judah. He was trying to bring, ba bring it back to God. They had gone astray. He had followed his daddy and his daddy's daddy, who took him down the wrong road, and Ace is like, no more. This is not going to be a generational curse on my watch. We're coming back to God. And so he was a reformer. So that's, that's the context that, that Asa was in. And, and, and look at 2 Chronicles with me. It says this, And he said to Judah, Let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers, gates and bars. The land is still ours. Why? Because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him, and he has given us peace on every side. And they prospered. One thing that you... I feel like you need to just get from, from Asa, and it didn't, it didn't actually end super awesome for Asa, which is interesting about seeking the Lord. Just because you seek the Lord once or in January doesn't mean that is credited through February. Like, this is a, this is a lifestyle. This is not 21 days. This is 21 years plus 21 years plus either Jesus comes back or another 21 years, and I'm like, eh, and then I die and go get to be with him, and I don't have to worry about my proximity because I'm like, Jesus... There you are. It was worth it. I knew it. I knew it. So Asa, here's, here's the one thing that I think you need to know about Asa is this. Um, potentially overwhelmed. Potentially somebody who walked through feelings of being like um, overwhelmed with the call of bringing a whole nation back to God. 
when he had stepped into generations of like idol worship and, and, and people moving away from God. And what does Asa do? What's, what's his one thing? He knows that his success is dependent upon him seeking God. Upon him seeking God. It's almost like Asa knew before Jesus came in with this idea of seek ye first the kingdom of God and all this other stuff will be added to you. It's almost like God had written that, whispered that somewhere on Asa's heart. And he knew historically that was true because he saw it work out in his life. One thing. And so our our final person that we meet is Jesus. <laughs> you guys want to say hi, Jesus? That's not weird, right? That's not sacrilegious. Some of them might go, oh, man, is that weird? No. Hi, Jesus. What's up, Jesus? He's our king. He's present. What's really, what's really interesting is um, talking about Jesus, right, and seeking Jesus. And, and there's this idea, uh, there's this reality, if you will, that um, that Jesus is present everywhere. This is like an omnipresence about Jesus, right? And so um, what's, what's interesting when we, when we think about that and we can kind of like um, divorce ourselves from this idea of how urgent we need to be about seeking Jesus um, because I, I, think, I think we kind of miss, miss a concept here. And so um, let's see. Uh, how about Travis? Are you okay to walk up on stage or at least walk up down here? Can you, can you do that now? Let's give it up for Travis. I have no flowers for Travis. But I'm just going to ask you to, to sit right here so you don't tower over me the whole time. <laughs> kind of part of that. Travis is a good, dear friend of mine. Travis has been here the whole time. He's been here the whole time. But now, check this out. Because I called him forward, because I invited him in, because I sought his presence, now Travis is right here. Now I can touch Travis. Now I can feel Travis. Now the presence of Travis matters. As a matter of fact, Travis is on our security team. So there. How you, how you like that? What? You gonna get after Jesus or what? You gonna leave Jesus over there? You gonna let Jesus hang out on the side? You gonna you gonna you gonna get after him? Well, if you wanna lead, if you wanna lead some sort of like mediocre sort of like okay, I, I get I'm forgiven, but I'm just gonna kind of go on with my life. Well, then Jesus can hang out over there, I guess. I mean, I don't know how that theology works out. But if you wanna do something of significance, if you wanna do something that requires courage and bravery, if you wanna see the kingdom of God come in a really beautiful and special and dynamic way, then you're gonna need Jesus close because you're gonna get scared and you're gonna think this is on you when really you can be. Living like, what? <laughs> oh, foster care, what? Oh, you want me to go share the gospel over there, what? Serve the homeless, what? We got this. <laughs> we got this. We got this. <laughs> Are you living like this with Jesus? Like up close? Like moment by moment? Please don't go. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> that's theological too, so please make the connection. Travis, you still here? I'm here. Travis, you still love me? Travis, you love me if I go over a little bit right now? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry. Travis, you love me if my performance wasn't awesome today? You're not going to leave me? Okay. One thing, Avenue Church, seek his presence. Okay, I'm hurrying. I'm going to finish up right here. I get warnings that help me finish on time. <laughs> I'm trying. 
I know. Thanks, Travis. <laughs> All right, Travis, what can we do in one minute? Here's the deal. We get 21 days of prayer and fasting that have the potential to do everything we just talked about. You're like, how do I do it? Just sign up for this. Participate in this. There's a, there's a number to text. You get the prayer things every day. Grab a journal. I've got this slide. I'm just going to finish with this. It's prepare, participate, partake, and partner. They're each just going to take 40 minutes for me to work through, so don't worry about it. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. We've got to go get our kids. Prepare. Grab a journal. Grab a journal and, 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 and text the number. It's going to give you the, the every day what we're praying for. We're praying for different things every day. We just want to do it together. And decide what you're going to fast. It could be a Daniel fast for a week, for all 21 days, for uh, one day a week. It could be a social media fast. It could be a TV fast. It could be whatever. You know, just, just think about what you're going, what good thing you're going to give up in order to pursue the better one thing. Participate. So, so do it. You know, one of the things I just wanted to suggest to you, I don't know if it's appropriate for you or not, but I just feel like the Lord wanted me to speak this to you, is I think some of you need to fast 20 minutes of sleep a day for 21 days and just get up and get after it. Um, Wednesday morning, we've got prayer at 7 a.m. Three, three coming Friday nights at Coastal Chapel. Like, come to at least one of those. Partake. Expect God to bring deliverance and healing and reconciliation and all those things the gospel brings. Expect something like awesome to happen. Just expect God to be God and, and to give you things that you don't yet have. Namely himself. And then finally, partner with us. Like, let this not just be a, a 21-day thing. In your bulletin here, there's small groups. The best way to make your life a one-thing life is to do it in community. Look at the groups and either today or by next week, pick the group that you're going to do the next semester of your life with because it's awesome to be a one-thing person. It's better to be a one-thing community. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward and we're going to sing. And um, There's some of you who need prayer for this. It's like, man, you've been wanting the one thing. You've been, you've been like, it's been a desire of your heart. But you just, you don't have the strength. You don't know, you don't know how to get there. Some of you, man, like you're making Jesus your one thing today. We want to we wanna offer a prayer team that can help you and pray some of these things into you before they've even become a reality. Sometimes prayer brings forth things before you start to experience them. And then you get to be like, God, that was awesome. Thanks, Travis. Not that he's God, but you know, like let's give it up for Travis. So we're going to sing Canvas in the Clay. It's 11.38. We're usually done by 11.45. Is that right? Is that when we normally end? So just if we happen to go a little over and just go grab your kids at 45. But we've got some time to sing and take that first step of getting after the one thing. Person of God. Get after him now. Because he's... <laughs> He's a God who loves to get after you. And I'm believing that he's already doing that for many of us. Let's worship that God and sing now. He's not finished with you yet. Come and receive that. Come and get that. Make the person and presence of God your one thing. Start this week by, by reading the full chapters of the five references I gave you. We've got a reading plan. Add that in there. I mean, you've got 20 minutes now that you've just dedicated and fasted of sleep to the Lord, right? Join us in prayer and fasting. And let's watch what happens when we become a people of one thing. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you like he did David. 
And may he give you hearts that seek after him. And may he draw you to himself and make you his people over and over again. Christ, we claim these things in your name. Amen. Love you guys. Jesus, Jesus.